Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, verse number 33, he says, it is he who sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to make it prevail over all religions, though the polytheists dislike it. Now, if you recall, in the previous verses, we were speaking about the corruption of the religious leadership within the community of Ahlul Kitab, the Jews and the Christians. And as you find that throughout this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references internal enemies of the faith and external enemies of the faith. So you have two classes of enemies, those who are within the religious fold, who are within the religion, who wage an internal war on Allah's religion, and then there are the external enemies. And their ultimate goal, as Allah had mentioned in ayah number 32, is that they wish to extinguish the light of God with their mouths. They want to extinguish the light of God because the light of God is inconvenient for them. They want to extinguish the light of God to preserve their worldly interests. So you see that there's a concerted effort by the internal enemies of Islam and the external enemies of Islam to extinguish this light. So you have these, these, this opposition. What does Allah say? Not only will he protect his light, Allah says, وَيَأْبَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا نُورَهُ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ not only is Allah going to preserve the light of guidance, not only is he going to protect it from being extinguished, he's going to increase it. He's going to complete it. How will Allah Azza wa do this? In ayah number 33, he says, Now, when you come to ayah number 33, there's a discussion among the commentators. There are some commentators that say that this verse is essentially saying that no aspect of Islam will remain hidden or unknown. Contrary to what we saw in previous religious traditions, religious traditions of the past like Christianity and Judaism, where certain truths were concealed and hidden from the people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that there will be ivhar, that every aspect of Islam through divine will will become manifest, it will be clear, that no one will be able to conceal it or hide it. So some of the non-Shia mufassirin have said that this ayah is referring to the fact that Allah will not allow any aspect of his religion to be concealed or hidden, contrary to what we see in Christianity and Judaism. So there are those who wish, wish to extinguish the light of God, but Allah Azza wa Jal will make his religion manifest through evidence and through proofs. So this is one interpretation of the verse that this ayah is speaking about Islam, and this is something that has already happened. No aspect of Islam has been concealed. There is a type of ivhar, there's a type of luhur with Islam. However, Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salatu wassalam, they say no, this ayah is actually a prophecy, meaning that this verse we have yet to realize this verse. This is a prophecy. According to a hadith attributed to Imam Al-Baqarah alayhi salam, our fifth Imam, when he was asked about this ayah, he says, Inna thalika yakunu inda khuruj al-Mahdi, that this prevailing, Islam prevailing 
over all the religions of the world Imam al-Baqir he says this will happen with the reappearance of the 12th Imam Fala, the Imam السلام, continues Fala yabqa ahadun illa aqarra bi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There will not be a single person but they will acknowledge and recognize the greatness of the Holy Prophet. So Ahlul Bayt السلام, they say that this verse is actually a prophecy because Islam has not prevailed over all religions. In fact, there are more Christians in the world than Muslims. There are over 7 billion people in the world today. One and a half billion are Muslims. And many of them are not, not even practicing Muslims. Many of them don't even understand the basics of their faith. So how has Islam prevailed over all religions? Islam has not even prevailed in the Muslim community, let alone over all of the religions of the world. There's a hadith also from the Holy Prophet where he says, again, he makes a prophecy. He makes a prediction about what, what, is, to, what is going to happen in the future. He says, لا يبقى, the Holy Prophet is speaking about this ayah. لا يبقى على ظهر الأرض بيت, بيت مدر ولا وبر إلا أدخله الله كلمة الإسلام. There will not be a single household on earth, whether it's in the city or in the village, in the mountains, in the plains, there will not be a single household, but that the word of Islam will have reached them. This shows you, brothers and sisters, that we have yet to even deliver the true message of Islam to all of the people of the world. There are people who have never heard of Islam, who have never been taught the pure and the genuine teachings of the Holy Prophet. In another hadith from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq again, we have many of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt who have commented on this ayah. Imam al-Sadiq he says, Wallahi ma nazala ta'wiluha ba'd. The Imam, Imam al-Sadiq, he makes a qasim. He says, I swear by God. So the Imam seems to be refuting all of those who claim that this ilhar has already taken place. Imam salam he says, Wallahi ma nazala ta'wiluha ba'd. Wa la yanzilu ta'wiluha hatta yakhruj al-qa'imu fa'idha kharaj al-qa'im lam yabqa kafirun billah al-azim. The Imam السلام, says, I swear by God that the prophecy of this verse has not yet been fulfilled. And it will not be fulfilled until the Qa'im, until the 12th Imam of Ahlul Bayt rises. And when he rises, there will not remain a single kafir on earth. Now, what does this mean? It seems that one of the first theological problems that the Imam السلام, will address is the problem of atheism. Now, whether we want to admit it or not, atheism is on the rise. Atheism is on the rise on the world stage, and it's even on the rise even within the Muslim community. There are many youth who are becoming agnostics, so this ideology that has a worldview where God is not part of the equation, where science is taught and science has divorced God from its inquiry into that, the natural world, the Imam السلام, is going to reconnect people with God. He's going to completely debunk the arguments of atheism. So you see that the Imam السلام, you know, before you teach people the details and the practices of religion, the Imam السلام, begins with aqaid. He corrects the people's worldview. He addresses, you know, these pressing questions. Now, it's interesting that when you look at ayah number, thir number 33, the ayah that we're speaking about, 
the Imam alayhi salam, he says, the, 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 the ayah says, huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa deen al haq li yudhirahu ala deen kulli. The ayah says that the religion of truth will prevail. Now this is significant. Allah says, huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa deen al haq that the religion of truth will prevail over all religions. Now, what is Deen al Haq? What is the religion of truth? Now, as many of you know, in Surah Al Ma'idah, ayah number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, towards the end of the Prophet's life, after the announcement, of Ali ibn Abi Talib's succession to the Holy Prophet. This is when Allah Azza wa Jal gives his stamp of approval. This is when Allah says, Al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum. Today I have perfected your religion, I have completed your religion. So prior to the announcement of Rasulullah in Ghadir, the deen was what? If Allah says, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum, today I have completed your religion, the day of Ghadir, that means prior to the day of Ghadir, the deen was what? It was incomplete. And if it's incomplete, it cannot, it does not qualify as deen al-haq. Therefore, deen al-haq, the religion of truth, which will prevail, is the religion whereby the Holy Prophet and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt are recognized as the guardians. And this, my dear brothers and sisters, is a point of reflection for us. Because someone may argue that Islam has reached every corner of the globe. Everyone around the world knows about Islam. Yes, there are many people, many Muslims are familiar with Islam, but they're familiar with the incomplete version of Islam. The version of Islam where Ali ibn Abi Talib is set aside. When the 12th Imam reappears, he will make Deen al Haq prevail. The religion where Amir al Mu'mineen and his 11 sons are seen as the protectors and the teachers of the Quran. This is the deen that will prevail. Deen al-haq liyudhihirahu ala deen kulli walau kariha al-mushrikun. Because deen al-haq has not even prevailed in the Muslim community. But this, the, the, the prevailing of deen al-haq will happen inshallah at the hands of the 12th Imam. Now, another Another ayah that I want to bring to your attention that's related to this verse is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he announced the creation of Adam, Allah in Surah Al-Baqarah, he says, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ Allah announces to the angels that he will place a khalifa on earth. Now they, the angels, they questioned. Oh Allah, are you going to place a vicegerent, a khalifa, a representative on earth who will shed blood and cause mischief? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not negate what they say. But rather, what does Allah say? I know what you don't know. Now, if Islam, if Deen al Haq does not prevail, if we do not witness the day, as the Ahadith say, where the 12th Imam will fill the earth with justice after it has been filled with oppression and tyranny, if that day never comes, that means the Malaika were right. Because today, all we see around the world is bloodshed and the spread of corruption. If there is not something that changes and makes the pendulum swing in another direction, if nothing happens, that means the malaika were right. And 
Allah's response to them, إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ would not make sense. So therefore, necessarily, at the end of time, there has to be, truth has to prevail over falsehood. There has to be a world where bloodshed becomes an anomaly. It becomes rare. The spread of corruption is minimized to a point where it becomes rare, where what is normalized is justice and the preservation of human life and social harmony and coexistence. So therefore, the luhur of the imam and the establishment of justice after the world has plunged into a dark era of bloodshed and, and corruption and universal sin, this is necessary because otherwise the malaika were right in protesting to God when he announced that he's going to appoint a khalifa on earth. Ayah number 34 of Surah at tawbah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, inna kathiran min al-ahbari wal-ruhban layakuluna amwal al-nasi bil-baatil wa yasudduna an sabeel Allah وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفِضَّةَ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَبَشِّرْهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Allah says, O oh, you who believe, verily many of the rabbis and monks consume the wealth of people falsely and turn from the way of God. They turn people from the way of God. As for those who hoard gold and silver and do not spend it in the way of God, give them the glad tidings of a painful punishment. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is addressing the mu'mineen. And Allah is calling the attention of the believers to something very unfortunate that took place in the Jewish community and in the Christian community. Now, for those of you who are familiar with medieval history, especially what was happening in Europe in the Dark Ages, there was uh, a man by the name of Martin Luther. You know the Lutheran Church? It's named after this individual. Martin Luther in, not, in uh, the year 1517, so we're talking about the 16th century in Europe. Who was Martin Luther? Martin Luther was a Protestant. He was a reformist, and he wrote 95 articles where he was, where he exposed the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. So he was voicing a lot of his grievances, his frustration with the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. And he distributed many of these articles throughout Europe. And this man became the catalyst for what later on became known as, known as the Reformation movement in Europe. Now, some of the main concerns of many of these religious reformists who were becoming very disenchanted and frustrated and appalled with the practices of the Roman Catholic Church, they had a number of grievances. Some of them were, for example, that they, they were against the Roman Catholic Church, the, the financial corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. They believed that the church was overtaxing the people. And many of you may be familiar with the introduction of indulgences. You know, for those of you who are familiar with this time period, you know, the Roman Catholic Church had a lot of projects and they wanted to, you know, build some of the largest cathedrals in Europe. And therefore they needed to finance a lot of these projects. So some of the religious leaders they basically offered indulgences. They sold indulgences to Christians. Now, what are indulgences? Indulgences are, are, are essentially payments. You know, people, they commit sins. So they pay money to the church, and the church gives them a receipt 
that your sins have been forgiven. If you have loved ones who have passed on and they're in Barzakh, they're in purgatory, and you want to eliminate the punishment or reduce their punishment, you pay money to the church. So people started to flood their religious institution with all of this money. So they were essentially selling toba. They were selling toba to people that if you want God to forgive you, they said, you know, you asking for forgiveness is not sufficient. Your faith in Jesus Christ is not sufficient because, you know, you're, you're fallible. You've defied God. So you need to do something that really demonstrates your, your commitment to repentance. And therefore, they started to sell these indulgences. And some of them went so far that they started to sell land. Land where? Not in dunya, in Jannah. They were selling real estate in paradise. So people were giving money to the church to have their sins forgiven, to have the sins of their loved ones forgiven, to have their loved ones who are in purgatory, to have their punishments minimized or eliminated. Some of them were purchasing plots of land in paradise. You see how ignorant the masses were? You see how a lot of these religious leaders were taking advantage of the ignorance of their communities. So this is number one. So Martin Luther was protesting against the financial corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. Number two, Martin Luther and other reformists, they believed that the only authority was the scripture. They rejected the religious authority of the Pope. They say the ultimate authority is the scripture, is the Bible. And would you believe, brothers and sisters, that, you know, we're talking about 16th century Europe. Would you believe that the Roman Catholic Church did not give access, did not give people, your common folk, access to the Bible? In fact, the Bible was reserved only for scholars. If you were to go to many of the Catholic churches in Europe during the 16th century, Many of them did not even have the Bible. People were denied access to the Bible. The public was not given access to the Bible. So they, they were essentially practicing what they heard from their religious leaders. They, they were not able to read the scriptures because they weren't translated in the language of the people. It remained in you know, ancient Aramaic or in Hebrew. And many of the people did not understand the language. So Martin Luther was calling and reminding people that the ultimate authority is the scripture and we have to make the Bible accessible to the people, that the people should be able to read the Bible, to reflect on the Bible. But of course, a lot of these religious leaders, they did not want people to have access to revelation, to the scripture. Because when you deny them access to the scripture, you're able to dictate to them the law of God. You completely make them dependent on the church. And another grievance that Martin Luther had and other reformists had was that they believed that every community should follow their local clergyman, meaning that he rejected this whole concept of a religious hierarchy. Now, in any case, with that in mind, I want, I'll read the translation again of the verse. Allah says, O you who believe, verily many of the rabbis and monks consume the wealth of people falsely. So with the example of the, uh, the monks and the priests, they were taking money from people in the form of indulgences and turn them from the way of God. How did they turn people from the way of God? Allah says, They turn people away from God. They don't allow people access to the scripture. Now, notice the Quran is very precise in its wording. Allah says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu inna kathiran min al-ahbari wal-ruhban layakuluna amwal al-nasi bil-baatil. Allah says, many of the rabbis and the monks. Allah doesn't say all. You see, the Holy Quran is precise in its wording. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't make sweeping generalizations. 
He doesn't accuse and level these allegations against all rabbis and monks. Some of them are pious. Some of them are righteous. If you recall in Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah number 82, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, praises some of the priests, some of the religious leaders in the Christian tradition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, tells the mu'mineen in ayah number 82 of Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَ You will find that those who have the most love, who are most inclined towards the mu'mineen, towards the believers, are those who say we are Christians. Why is that? Why, do they, why are they so inclined towards us? ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ مِنْهُمْ قِسِّيسِينَ وَرُغْبَانًا وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ It's because they have good religious leadership. They have priests and monks who are humble, who have humility, and they instill this humility in their followers. So this is an example. So we spoke about the indulgences and denying Christian, the Roman Catholics, access to the scripture. Now with respect to the rabbis, so this was what was happening in, in major sec sections of the Christian community. Now with the rabbis, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that many of the rabbis, as we mentioned in previous verses, they distorted, they made forbidden, they made permissible what Allah has made forbidden. And this is the type of worship that is mentioned in the previous verses, how people are obeying these religious leaders and they're going against divine commandments. One of the things that many of the rabbis did was that they announced the permissibility of usury, of interest. Ayah number 161 of Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَأَخْذِهِمُ الرِّبَى وَقَدْنُهُ عَنْ وَأَكْلِهِمْ أَمْوَالَ النَّاسِ بِالْبَاطِلِ Allah mentions the financial corruption of the rabbis, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they would take interest. They established a usury-based economy. They would take interest from people. They'd loan out money and they would charge astronomical uh, percentages of interest. And they were prohibited from doing so. In the sharia of Musa, interest and usury is forbidden. Riba is forbidden. وَأَكْلِهِمْ أَمْوَالَ النَّاسِ They would consume the money of the people. Now, in some of, some of the, the Jews during the time of the Prophet and even before that, not all of them, but some of them, they did not consider social contracts with Gentiles to be binding. So, for example, if they enter and they, they, if they enact a contract, if they have a business contract with someone, if the third party was a Jew, they would honor it. They would respect the wealth of that individual. But if they were engaging in a transaction with a Gentile, they felt that it was not binding for them to honor that business contract. And this is one of the ways that they would consume the wealth of others falsely. That just because they are, you know, kuffar in your eyes, it doesn't mean that you rob them, that you take advantage of them. And unfortunately, there are many within the Muslim community. They'll cheat people because they'll say, oh, this person is not Muslim, and therefore it's okay for me to cheat them and to consume their wealth. We have to remember, brothers and sisters, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was a sadiq al -ameen. He was the honest and, and the trustworthy. The trustworthy. With who? With the mushrikeen of Mecca. Even when the mushrikeen plotted to assassinate the Prophet, Rasulullah leaves Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib in Mecca. And one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why Imam, Imam is left salam, in Mecca is so he can return the amanat to the mushrikeen, to the same people who are plotting to kill the Holy Prophet. So it's not a valid excuse to say that because this person 
follows a different religious tradition. I dehumanize them and I, I rob them or I, I don't honor their, their wealth. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says the last part of the ayah, وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفِضَّةَ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَبَشِّرْهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ As for those who hoard gold and silver and do not spend it in the way of God, give them the glad tidings of a painful punishment. Now, now, before I, I comment on this, I just wanted to mention one more point with respect to وَيَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ So we mentioned that many of the, the rabbis and the monks and the priests, they did not give the public access to scripture. And this, this was a way of exercising social control because they did not want anyone to challenge them and they wanted to dictate to the masses what God has prohibited and what God has made lawful. So it was, you know, uh, uh, a way of securing their power. Now, additionally, you find that not only did these religious leaders deny the public access to the scripture, many of them, they concealed some of the prophecies within the scripture. You know, many of the Jews and the Christians who did not end up believing in the Prophet, they rejected the Prophet because of the misguidance of their own religious leaders. So for example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayah number 46, Allah says, الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ kitab." Those who were given the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians, Ahlul Kitab, those who were given the book, now those who are given the book, it's supposed to be all people, but because the religious leaders were the only ones who had access to the scripture, Allah says, يَعْرِفُونَهُ They knew the Prophet. They knew about the prophecies. They knew about the details, about the advent of Rasulullah. يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءُهُمْ They were so well versed and they had so much information about the advent of Rasulullah in Mecca, that they knew him better than they knew their own children. Can you imagine how much ma'rifah they had about the Holy Prophet? That they, they knew the prophetic description even better than they knew the descriptions of their own children. Allah says, وَإِنَّ فَرِيقًا مِّنْهُمْ and some of them, some of the rabbis, some of the priests and the monks, they concealed the truth, and they knew very well that Muhammad ibn Abdullah was the final messenger of God, but they concealed it. When people would ask, is there such thing as a prophet who will emerge at the end of times? They will say, oh yeah, but it's not this man. So again, they deceived many people and they will be held accountable on the day of judgment because they misguided others they turned many people away from the path of god now allah says and for those who hoard gold and silver it's interesting that during the time of uthman ibn affan they, when they were gathering copies of the Qur'an and they wanted to put this stamp on, on the copy of the Qur'an and to recognize it as the official copy of the state, some of the Sahaba, some of the Muslims wanted to get rid of the letter Wow. You know how Allah says, if you look at the ayah, it says, وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفِضَّ If you remove the Wow, it means that those Christians, those monks and those rabbis who were hoarding gold and silver, meaning that this is a phenomenon in the past. It's not speaking about something that's happening now. But when you put the wow, it becomes a universal statement. Those, whether they're Muslims or from Ahlul Kitab, 
والذين يكنزون الذهب والفضة ولا ينفقونها في سبيل الله فبشرهم بعذاب أليم. And this is precisely what Uthman ibn Affan was doing, what the Umayyads were doing. They were hoarding gold and silver. Now, what does it mean to hoard gold and silver? Because gold and silver was the currency of the time. Does that mean that we as Muslims are not allowed to have savings accounts? Because saving is a type of hoarding. You're saving money. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, so, so what is the meaning of hoarding? If I have a savings account, am I among الَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفِضَّةِ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ If you go to Surah number 51, Surah Al-Dhariyat, Ayah number 19, Allah mentions that in order for you to not be considered among those who hoard wealth, there is a right in your wealth that has to be distributed to others. That some of your wealth has to be spent in the way of God. When Allah describes the muttaqin, when He describes the believers in ayah number in, in Surah al dhariyat one of the descriptions of the pious is what? وَفِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌّ لِلسَّائِلِ وَالْمَحْرُومِ That the muttaqin are those whom in they are the ones who in their wealth, there is an acknowledged right, there is a haq in their wealth for the beggar and for the deprived. There are two types of poor people. There is someone who is poor and they beg you, they ask you for help. There are many people who beg in the streets. There are many people who ask you for help because they're so desperate. Allah says they have a right over, they have a right over you. And then there are those who are deprived, but they don't beg. They have pride. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the muttaqeen are the ones who recognize that they do not own their entire wealth. There is a portion of it that is the haq, that is the right of others, and Allah has placed it in your hands as a trust that has to be delivered to these two categories of poor people. That it's not your wealth. Allah says, I have distributed rizq among my creation and sometimes I have placed the rizq, the sustenance of others in your hands and I have made it your job to deliver it to them as a test for you. Now, how, how can we not be among those who hoard wealth? We spend it in the way of Allah. We pay our religious dues. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Kullu malin to addi zakatahu falaysa bikans. The Prophet says, any wealth which you, which you pay your zakat, you pay your religious dues, then you are not considered among those who hoard their wealth. Now there are certain circumstances where Someone may pay their... So if you don't want to be among those who are considered hoarders of gold and silver, you have to pay your religious dues. You have to pay your zakat. You have to pay your khums. You have to pay your zakat al-fitra. You have to pay your nether. If you made a nether, you, you made a vow to feed you know, a number of poor people. You have to fulfill and pay all of your religious dues. This is number one. But the ahadith also mentioned that there are certain circumstances where in order for you to not be considered among those who hoard gold and silver, you have to actually go above and beyond your paying your religious dues. You know, for example, someone may pay zakat and khums, but you have people in your, in your neighborhood who are hungry, who are starving. In that case, you may have to pay even more than your zakat and khums. In fact, we have a hadith where the Ahlul Bayt have mentioned this ayah in light of the dhuhur of the 12th Imam. There's a hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam where he says, مُوَسَّعٌ عَلَىٰ شِيَعَتِنَا أَنْ يُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا فِي أَيْدِيهِمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Imam al-Sadiq says, 
our Shias are free to spend their money the way that they wish, to use it for good. You know, you pay your zakat and your khums, and then you have extra money, you have disposable income, you're free to do with it what you please. Provide for your family, you know, uh, make your family more comfortable if you want to donate to certain charities. The Imam says our Shia have the freedom to do with their disposable income as they wish. To do ma'roof, to do good with it as they wish. And then the Imam says, Imam al-Sadiq says, فَإِذَا قَامَ قَائِمُنَا حَرَّمَ عَلَى كُلِّ ذِي كَنْزٍ كَنْزَ Imam al-Sadiq says, when the 12th Imam reappears, you are not allowed to use your disposable income. Your disposable income, when the 12th Imam reappears, belongs to the 12th Imam. After you cover all of your expenses, what is left over belongs to the Imam. And because when the Imam reappears, brothers and sisters, he has a big job. You know, in the same way, Rasulullah needed the wealth of Khadija to to spread islam and to sustain his movement the 12th imam also needs financial support and therefore his followers have to give him this financial support to help him against his enemies because the 12th imam will have many enemies so it's not only that you say you put your hand on your head and you say that oh imam we are here no no you have to take your money and you have to give it to the imam because the imam will need major financial support and whatever the imam gives you back then that's money that you can that you can use and spend with it whatever you want but when the imam reappears one of these struggles is that the struggle of wealth the jihad with wealth to support the imam with your wealth and then imam sadiq mentions this verse there will be many Shias, many Muslims who will hoard their money when the 12th Imam reappears. And when the Imam calls out, just like Imam al Hussein, Hal min nasir in yansuruna, many will say, Ibn Rasulullah, I have a 401k, I cannot touch it. I have a lot of money that I've saved up, and they won't give it to the Imam. And then this is where Allah says, فَبَشِّرُهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Give them the glad tidings of a painful punishment. Because on the day of in Muharram, they say, يَا لَيْتَنَا كُنَّا مَعَكُمْ to Imam al Hussein. But when the 12th Imam, when their Imam reappears and he asks them for support, they will fail the Imam because they're attached to their wealth. Now this verse, brothers and sisters, is a very powerful verse. It's related, it was related to people who came in the past to the Jews and the Christians and it also relates to many of the Muslim leaders after the death of the Prophet, the likes of Uthman and Muawi. In fact, Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari was very, he was uh, very outspoken and very vocal against the financial corruption of Uthman and Muawiyah. In fact, Abu Dhar was so courageous that he actually goes to Sham. He goes to Damascus, and look at what he does. He stands outside of the palace of Muawiyah, and what does he do? Abu Dhar doesn't have an army. He doesn't have any weapons. He stands outside of the palace of Muawiyah, and he recites this ayah. Abu Dhar will recite this ayah on loop every day, every day, every day. Until I remember one of the ulama was telling me, uh, I haven't read this hadith, this narration, but one of the scholars relayed this story to me and I'll share it with you. He says that Abu Dhar would recite this ayah day in and day out. Muawiyah became so annoyed, so frustrated, so aggravated that Muawiyah told one of his servants that go and stop Abu Dhar from reciting this verse. He's driving me crazy. 
Because every day he would recite this ayah. So he tells one of his Muawiyah, tells one of his servants, go, if you're able to stop him from reciting this ayah, I will free you. You're a slave. You're my servant. I'll free you. I'll give you freedom. So the servant anxiously runs out of the palace and he goes to the gate where Abu Dhar is standing and he's reciting. Abu Dhar is reciting this. This servant comes and he says, Ya Abu Dhar, can you stop reciting this ayah? It's irritating Muawiyah. Of course, Muawiyah is irritated by the Quran. It's irritating Muawiyah. Abu Dhar says, I'll never stop. I'll only stop when he stops hoarding and he distributes this gold and silver to the fuqara, to the poor, to the destitute, until he stops abusing his power. This servant says that I beg you, if you stop, he will grant me freedom. I'm a slave, O Abu Dhar. If you stop reciting, Muawi will give you freedom. What does Abu Dhar say? He says that if I stop, I will become the slave. He's going to give you freedom. But if I stop and I'm silent in the face of this lulm, then I will become the slave. And I am only a slave of God. Abu Dhar, Muawiyah eventually sent word to Uthman that this Uthman take him and punish him. And then Uthman was banished into the desert of al rabada where he died alone. You know, this is, you know, they talk about Sahaba. Look at what Muawiyah did to the Sahaba. Look at what Uthman did to Abu Dhar, the Sahaba of Rasulullah. In any case, so Allah says, those who hoard gold and silver and they do not spend it in the way of God, give them the glad tidings of a painful punishment. Now, you may ask, what is this painful punishment? Allah in ayah number 35 he gives he he becomes very descriptive. He gives us a detailed explanation, a description of this painful punishment. Allah says, "Yawma yuhma alayha fi nari jahannam, fatukwa biha jibahum wa junubum wa zhuurum. Hada ma kanaztum li anfusikum, fadhuqu ma kuntum taknizun." Allah says on the day, meaning on the day of judgment in the hereafter, on the day when it will be heated, meaning the gold coins and the silver coins, the dhahab and the filva, when it will be heated in the fire of hell, and their foreheads, their sides, and their backs will be branded with it. This is what you hoarded up for yourselves. So taste that which you hoarded. It's very descriptive and it's very graphic. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he knows what he created. Allah could have omitted all of the ayat that speak about punishment and only speak about the verses about Jannah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that fear is also a powerful motivator, you know. And this is why Allah sometimes He promises reward and sometimes He threatens with punishment. And in many cases, if it were not for the threat of punishment, many of us, we would destroy our own souls. So because Allah Azza wa Jal loves us, He threatens us with punishment. In the same way that you threaten your children with punishment if they fail their exams, if they don't do their homework. You threaten them with punishment because you know that if you don't threaten them with punishment, they're going to engage in behavior that is even more destructive. That what will happen to them if they don't do their homework and they don't do well in school is even more severe than the, the threat that you're giving them. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about punishment, you have to understand that this punishment is nothing but the reality of the action itself, as we mentioned in our previous discussions. Now, what is the reality of hoarding wealth? 
and denying those who are in need, turning away from the poor, not spending it in the way of God. There are three parts of the body that become branded. You guys are familiar with branding where, you know, especially cattle, you know, they heat, you know, a rod and they brand, you know, branding is, you know, we associate it with branding animals. They brand animals. Allah says that those who hoard gold and silver, they will also be branded in Jahannam. And three parts of their body will be branded. Their foreheads, their sides, meaning their legs, and their backs. Now, there's a discussion among the Mufassirin of the Qur'an as to why is it that these three parts are mentioned. Now, in Tafsir al-Mizan, Allama Taba Taba, he says, because he says the forehead, the legs, and the back are mentioned because with, with respect to the forehead, you know, people throughout history, they've made gold and silver the object of an object of worship. So he says that, you know, bowing the forehead is a way that you kind of express worship for something. He also says that, Allama Taba Taba, he says that in many cases, you acquire wealth by walking towards it. Especially in the past, you had to exert a bit of labor to acquire wealth. So you would walk towards it. And also people in the past, when they would acquire wealth, they would carry it on their backs, especially if it, be, if it became a large amount of money. They would carry gold and silver coins on their backs. So the act of hoarding, you know, is, uh, is related to these three body parts. However, Ayatollah Nasr Makaram al-Shirazi in Tafsir al-Anthal, he says no. He says this branding is because someone who doesn't want to give money to the less fortunate, they typically turn away from the poor by either turning their faces away you know, you know, if someone asks you for money and you want to deny them, you, you lift your head up. You move your forehead away from them. Or you walk away from them. You use your legs and you walk away. Or you turn your back on them. So Sheikh Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi says that because these are the three common ways that you turn away from helping the less fortunate, Allah says that this same money will be heated and those parts of the body will be branded because those are the parts of the body that people typically use to deny and turn away from those who are less fortunate. And then the angels will say to these individuals, هَذَا مَا كَنَسْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ That this is, this is what you hoarded up for yourselves. Meaning that this punishment is nothing but the reality of your amal. In dunya, هَذَا مَا كَنَسْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ فَذُوقُوا مَا, كن... ما... فَذُوقُوا مَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْنِزُونَ So taste what you were hoarding in dunya, meaning experience the reality of that action, of the action of denying the less fortunate and amassing wealth for yourself. Inshallah, we'll continue our discussion with ayah number 36. Next week, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. If there are any questions or comments, we can take them now, inshallah. Yeah, so uh, one person asked, uh, you're talking about hoarding money. Uh, does this ayat relate just to hoarding gold and silver or to hoarding in general? No, it refers to to hoarding, hoarding wealth, anything that is considered wealth, anything that can, that's, that has value and could be beneficial to people is wealth. Now, the reason why Dhahab and Fidla are mentioned in this ayah is because gold and sil silver were, that was the main currency of the time. But hoarding anything that has value, that can benefit the less fortunate, is uh, can also be considered 
a type of uh, of hoarding because even when it comes to uh, zakat and khums, you don't only pay khums on your currency, you pay khums on on even things that you haven't used for you know a year, for example. If you have a shirt, you have clothing, and one year has passed and you have not worn it, you have to pay religious dues on that, you have to pay khums on. So because gold and silver were the common currency at the time, it's specifically uh, what's mentioned. Um, for verse 33, what is the significance of the clause, though the polytheist may be averse? How important is the aversion of the polytheist when so many polytheists of the past have passed away without this prophecy affecting them? And if the Imam doesn't return during the lifetime of the polytheists living today, they will also not be impacted by this verse. It's a very good question. What's the significance of Now, even though you know the polytheists of the past, you know, are not necessarily affected by uh by the vuhur of the uh, the twelfth imam, you have to understand that, you know, those, you know, for example, when we speak about the uh, the twelfth imam and how he's going to avenge the uh, the killers of Imam al Hussein. Now, you may say that when the twelfth imam reappears, those who killed Imam al Hussein salam, are not even around. Shima is not around. Or, these individuals are not around. So how is the Imam going to avenge the killing of Imam al Hussein when his direct killers, his actual killers, have passed away? It's because the same those who embrace that ideology will still be around. Similarly, when the twelfth Imam reappears, there are still those who embrace this this ideology, and perhaps part of the punishment. Of the people of uh, of Barzakh, the the Mushrikeen, is that you know it's possible that they will receive news of how Islam has has prevailed. Now, walau kariha al mushrikun also is an indication that that shirk will exist. That shirk will not be eradicated up until the zuhur of the twelfth Imam. Now, shirk. During the time of the Prophet, existed in the form of idol worship. People used to bow to idols, but the ideology of shirk also exists today, where people see, you know, things other than God as their providers, as their protectors. So in the past, it was an idol, but today it might be it might be entire institutions that that you know that don't represent. You know what Islam would deem to be permissible. You know, you know, ultra capitalism, for example. You know, technology, whatever it may be, things that you turn to other than God, that you find, you know, that you consider a safety net, that you consider a source of your protection other than God. This is also, you know, uh, a form of shirk. So, walau karihal mushrikun, this could relate to the mushrikun who are living during the time when this happens or it can be a statement that affects all of them because we know that mushrikeen who have passed away they also they also know about what's happening in the alam al dunya so there there's a type of connection between the living and the dead that they're not totally oblivious to what's happening in the alam al dunya Could this maybe be a, a message of hope or resolve that even though the mushrikeen are, are going to be fighting against this, Allah will still succeed in the end? Oh, it, it, it's definitely it's definitely to give hope to the mu'mineen that you know even if the mushrikeen outnumber the mu'mineen and they have all of the resources, even if they're superpowers and they have the most powerful militaries and they have all of the technology, even if they have all that. The twelfth Imam is going to prevail, even if they dislike it. They're not. They're not going to be able to do anything about it. And Allah has given us many examples throughout history 
where a minority has defeated a majority with the permission of God. You know, the story of, of David and Goliath, the Muslims in the Battle of Badr, in, in, uh, in other battles, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives victory to the mu'mineen when they are united and when they are steadfast. And when they are obedient to the ma'asum of their time. So following this divinely appointed leadership is also a, definitely a major factor in achieving victory. And on the topic of um, that the angels complain to Allah about mankind causing mischief, does Allah actually deny that mankind will not spread mischief? I think uh, and I think in the Quran it says like Allah says, I know what you do not know. And could that imply that there may be other mitigating circumstances which make that mischief worthwhile instead of um, saying that, hey, the Imam Mahdi will come at the end of the times and eradicate the mischief at that point in time? Now, it as I mentioned, when the angels make the case, because the malaika are essentially you know, trying to nominate themselves for the position of being the representatives of God on earth. You know, they say, Why are you appointing, not Adam in particular, but human beings as your representatives when they have this tendency of bloodshed and spreading mischief? You know, they're corrupt, they're violent. So this is this is why they believe that insan is disqualified from this the position of Khalifatullah. And and they make the case from the, themselves. They say, We are more worthy. That we sanctify you, we glorify you, we praise you. We're always connected to you, we're always remembering you, and therefore we're more qualified. Notice when Allah says, Qala inni a'lamu ma la Allah doesn't deny that human beings will cause bloodshed and, and spread mischief. Allah never says that. You, Allah doesn't tell the angels you're wrong, right? Because even if you look at Adam salam's children, the first murder, the, the first bloodshed that took place. It didn't happen generations later. Adam's children. Abil kills Habil. You know, so there are four people on earth. Adam, Hawa, and then you have, you know, Qabil. And, so you, you have almost one-fourth of mankind is wiped out in the first generation. So the malaika were not wrong. But while Allah, what's, what's implied in Allah's response is that, yes, they will shed blood, they will spill blood, they will spread corruption. However, eventually haq will prevail over batil. That the end of this story, the story of man, is a good ending, is a positive ending. And notice, you know, just as a side comment, you know, some Muslims, they believe that, you know, the khilafah of Abu Bakr is legitimate because of ijma'ah. They say, you know, Abu Bakr is a rightful successor because there was a consensus among the Muslims that he was fit to lead. Notice in this ayah, there's ijma among the malaika that human beings should not be khalifatullah. And Allah rejects the ijma of angels. If Allah doesn't accept the consensus of infallible angels, he's going to accept the consensus of a handful of companions in Safifa. So this shows you that the argument of ijma' is invalid even according to the Qur'an. This was just a side comment. So yeah, so I agree that uh, Allah doesn't deny that human beings will spread mischief and cause bloodshed, but Allah implies that this is something that will eventually be eradicated to a certain extent. It, this will not be the case up until the Day of Judgment. And uh, do we have any idea how long um, mankind will last on this earth after Imam Mahdi's Zahur? Because uh, it seems odd to have d uh, tens of thousands of years uh, where you've got chaos and bloodshed or possibly more, however long mankind has been on, on this planet, and then maybe just a few years of 
my Mandy's peace and security as a trade off? You know, that's that's a very good question. And off the top of my head, I'm not sure because I'll tell you again, just from the top of my head, what I what I can recall. You know, there are many different narrations that speak about how long the Imam alayhi salam will rule. And then there's the the, the discussion about Raja'a, where you know there are you know members of the Ahlul Bayt will will be revived and they will rule for a certain period of time, Imam al Hussein and other Imams. Now is that, you know, so there, we have a, a discrepancy with respect to how long the Imams will rule. Now, what we do know is that the Holy Prophet ﷺ is referred to as the Prophet of Akhir zaman the Prophet of the end of times. Now, again, I'm just thinking out loud here, so just bear with me. If the Prophet ﷺ, if Muhammad ibn Abdullah ﷺ is the Prophet of the end of times, that means necessarily that the amount of time before him is greater than the amount of time between him and the Day of Judgment. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if, if the Prophet is the Prophet of the end of times, that means the time period between him and Yom Al-Qiyamah has to be shorter than the time period between him and Adam. So if you say that the Imams are going to rule for thousands and tens of thousands of years, it's difficult to reconcile that with the many ahadith that we have that call the Prophet Nabi Akhir zaman Now, one possible way of reconciling it is by saying that Akhir zaman refers to the, the time period up until the Zuhur of the Imam. That's what's meant by not Akhir zaman and not necessarily the Day of Judgment. So those are two poss uh, you know, two different uh, you know, uh, views. So if you believe that the Prophet being called the Prophet of the end of times, end of times meaning the Day of Judgment, then the Imams are necessarily going to have to rule for a time period that's less than the time period between the Prophet and, and Adam. And, and again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. You want to follow up, God? Salaam alaikum, Shaykh. Wa salam wa yes, when uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, told the angels that He's going to uh, create His representative on the earth. And then the angel replied, Kalu atajalu fiha mayufsidu fiha yasfatima. That are you going to create that one who's going to spread mischief and shed blood? But how did the uh, angels get that knowledge? How did they know that uh, this is going to happen? Did they see it happening before? Yeah. Or uh, did they have ilme laduni? So there are, there are, there are different opinions regarding how the angels knew about the nature of man. Because, because that's a very strange assumption to make if Adam is the first human being, you know, you know, Malaika, you know, they're they're better than humans. So, you know, in akhlaq, we're always taught to have husnul van, yes, to have a good opinion, to assume the best. So here you have Malaika who are doing what? They're assuming the worst. So if Adam is a new creation, and angels have had no prior experience with human beings then it would not make sense for them to make this assumption, to make this, you know, uh, allegation. Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, we have a hadith, for example, from Imam al-Baqir, alayhi salam, and other Imams that speak about the creation of many Adams before the final Adam. So it seems that the earth, al-Ard, was inhabited by what the ahadith call nisnas, Nisnas are human-like creatures that roam the earth, maybe what we would call primitive man that inhabited the earth, and perhaps they engaged in a lot of violence. They were 
they they shed a lot of blood they were very harsh and aggressive with each other and it's perhaps this experience that prompted the angels to assume that this Adam السلام, and his progeny are going to be similar to the human-like creatures that we witnessed before Adam. So Ahlul Bayt السلام, they say that before Adam, there were many Adams that were created. But this Adam السلام, who was the, the husband of Hawa has reached a point where the aql has reached full maturation. And then from his progeny, you know, uh, come, you know, the rest of us. Uh, there's one follow up question, uh, Sheikh. No. Um, when uh, Shaitan, Iblis was not exposed till Adam salam was blown with the Ruh of Allah. And then when he said uh, to the angels to prostrate uh, to Adam salam and then um, the, uh, Iblis uh, refused uh, because the um, uh, Quran says, Aba wa stakbara, and then wa kana min al kafirin. So uh, when there was no shaitan uh, before Adam salam was created, I mean, there was shaitan, sorry about it. And um, how did people create, how those nesnas created the uh, uh, mischief and bloodshed when uh, shaitan was not there, when Iblis had not become yeah. shaitan. Yeah, yeah. So that's an excellent question. Now, this is a common misconception that people have, that the only cause of sin and mischief, mischief is Iblis. But the reality is that your worst enemy is actually not Iblis, because Iblis doesn't have any influence over you. He doesn't have any authority over you. He doesn't have any sultan over the human being. The only thing that Iblis can do is that he can suggest, he can make insinuations, he can whisper into your heart. He can only suggest, he cannot coerce. This is why Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, A'da aduwik, nafsuka lati bayna jambayk, that your, your worst enemy, your worst adversary is not Iblis, it's your soul. So. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he says, you know, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا We have this capacity in us that evil is dormant in us in the same way that good is dormant in us. And this is why in the month of Ramadan, in the month of Ramadan, we know that according to the ahadith that Iblis is chained up. If Iblis is the single cause of sin, how is it that people still commit sin in the month of Ramadan? It means we still have this nafsul ammara. So the only reason why shaitan is effective is because you, it's because of nafsul ammara. So if, if nafsul ammara, you know, listens to these satanic suggestions, this is when it's, it's prompted to commit sin even more. But it still has the ability to defy God even without the influence of shaitan. Now, shaitan makes it a bit more difficult. Shaitan has made the trial a bit more difficult. But even without shaitan, human beings still have desires. They still have inclinations towards, you know, lowly uh, desires. So shaitan has just made the, the trial a bit more difficult. But, you know, one could ask, if Iblis is the single cause of sin, one way to refute that is that what made Iblis sin? So this means it's his own nafs. So you cannot say that the, the only thing that causes people to sin is Iblis because what caused Iblis to sin? His own self, his own nafs. Is that clear? Thank you very much. And um, so if there were uh, many Adams before Adam and Adam before each one of those. How do we know which Adam is being referred to in the Quran? Uh, out of that, we how do we know that it's the very last one, or could it be that what's referred to in Islam is maybe a uh, multiple of those Adams in a metaphorical sense? You know, we, we don't know, but you know, in the in the Arabic in the Arabic language, when you use a definite article, you know, if uh, like for example. 
when I'm talking to you and I say, you know, what time does the class begin? You're automatically going to assume that I'm talking about the Wednesday class because, you know, there's there's an automatic assumption that's made. It's tabadur, right? And this is in Arabic we call this lamul ahd, where, you know, when you use a definite article, and your listener, you know, is automatically gonna his mind is gonna go towards one specific meaning. That's usually the intended meaning. Now, for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to use Adam and mean the previous Adams, that would require, you know, uh, supporting evidence because, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when we speak about Adam is Adam, the father of, of humanity, the, the husband of Hawa. So that, that is, that's the natural assumption that's made when you use the word Adam. In the same way that when I use the word class with you, your assumption is, going to be that I'm referring to the Wednesday class unless I give you an indication that I mean something else. I mean another class. That's just the, you know, the way that the language works.